visiting with us this morning, we'd like to extend a special welcome to you. We're very glad that you're here, and we hope that you encounter Christ here as well. There are several announcements in your bulletin, and I call your attention to those. Uh, first and most importantly, we are ordaining and installing new elders today. Uh, and you'll find that information just in your bulletin, uh, where we frequently do communion. Uh, there's also a call session meeting immediately after worship uh, for the process of receiving new members into the church. So if you would like to join the church, uh, or if you are an elder on the session, uh, please meet me in the fellowship hall immediately following worship. Are there other announcements that need to come to our attention this morning? One more? Yes, from uh, Christian Education and also from Fellowship, I wanted to let everyone know that our Joy Gift Giving program will be uh, Sunday, the 22nd of December, and it'll be right after our regular service. What we want to do is have a potluck downstairs and then have our children. Uh, have a Christmas pageant kind of a nativity scene. What's really important about this message is that if you're a parent or a grandparent and you have children who want to be here, please let me know. Uh, there's only one practice session, and that'll be the day before, because their memory are a little short. <laughs> so our practice Saturday real short, and then Sunday, and we hope to see everyone at the door Oh, and there's cookie exchange.
Testament reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 17 to 25. Hear the word of the Lord. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy, and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it, or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth. And one who falls short of a hundred will be considered a curse. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall be the days of my people. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord, and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the, ship, the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades that the word of our God endures forever. The psalm is Psalm 98, and it's in your bulletin. And as we do, this side will be the unbolded section, and this side will be the bolded. And I will read this section, and Lisa will read this section. <coughs> O oh, sing to the Lord of the new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and the faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. <coughs> These praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of the melody. With the trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King. Let the sea roar, and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands, let the hills sing together for joy and the presence of the Lord, for He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people with equity. New Testament reading comes from 1 John chapter 4. Let us hear the word of God. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know that the Spirit, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. Little children, you are from God, and have conquered them. For the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. 
From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must also love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is a whole bunch, is it? Last week, we talked a great deal about God's love for us that results in us being made children of God. Little siblings of Jesus Christ, people who are going to grow up to have a character like God, who, who grow up to love people the way God loves people. And then during the week, one of you called me and said, Okay, Sarah Jane, but what is God's love? It can mean a lot of different things. And I was delighted, because this is what John 4 is about. Tracking with John is excellent. Welcome to chapter 4. What is God's love? Possibly the most famous line in chapter 4, the one that you see a lot quoted uh, in the defense of various things, is in verse 8, God is love. We've all heard that before, right? And as soon as you start trying to take it seriously, God is love, all sorts of questions come up. What does it mean that God is love? Uh, does it mean that love is God? Can uh, anything be excused so long as it's done in the name of love? Can we cheat and lie and sacrifice other relationships if it's done because we love someone? And what does love look like? Is it uh, the kind of grasping love that at its best wants to protect and at its worst wants to control or collect? Is it a kind of toothless, benign affection for the world and everything in it? Remember the cartoon image of God sitting on a cloud with a long beard? That God loves everything vaguely. <laughs> doesn't seem to matter very much. Is it pastel-colored, sugar-sweet sentimentality? Or is it harsh, unpleasant love, tough love, that claims to be for the good of the person it's inflicted on? What does God's love look like? <coughs> First John seems to think this, that if God is love, God's love must look like God. God himself. God's love looks like God. <clears throat> and initially, left to our own devices, this doesn't help a whole lot. And by ourselves, we don't have any way of knowing what God might look like. There have been brilliant people, for example, from before we can remember, time of the memorial, who have tried to figure out uh, what God is like based on what the world is like. And at first, uh, this seems like a promising avenue, because uh, we can look at sunsets 
steps or the forest, or we can hike the Cascades, or we can just look out the window here and say, God is beautiful. So far, so good. And then we can look at the ocean or at space and say, God is great. God can be contained. So far, so good. But then maybe we look at uh, the ground and see dirt. This is very different from uh, water. So maybe we have a dirt god and water god. Makes sense, right? Uh, maybe we can look at uh, a lion stalking a deer. Or just at the fact that all life seems to depend on killing and eating something else. And say, God depends on... Uh, eating things. Uh, sometimes we might look at parasites and see that death is ugly and uh, cruel. And then what do we say about God? There's a great line, I don't know where it came from, but it says, people who worship nature tend to forget that nature intends to kill them, and one day it will succeed. Is it true then about God? that he intends to kill us, and one day he will succeed. The Christian faith says no. And further, it says that if we were so perfect, if sin hadn't infected us and the world around us, uh, we could have learned the truth about God by looking at the world. But sin has hurt our eyesight. Uh, and now we're all terribly nearsighted, nearly blind. And we need a really strong uh, prescription of, of spectacles to be able to see the truth about God now. God has given us the glasses in the form of the Word of God. And the Word of God means the Bible, it does. Uh, but primarily it means Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We know who God is because we know who Jesus Christ is. And we know who Jesus Christ is because we have witnesses to him. The Bible, of course, is the primary one. We know what God is like because we know what Jesus Christ is like. And then, uh, for the same reason, we know what God's love looks like. God's love looks like Jesus Christ. We talked a little last week, and I think the week before that as well, uh, about the fact that God's love is active, that it accomplishes things, that it changes your status, it changes your life and your future. And so, as specifically as you can get, God's love looks like being born for our sake, as we remember here in a month, in poverty and obscurity, to a single mother. It looks like sharing our life and nature, really, truly human, without stopping to be really, truly God. <clears throat> it looks like torture and death for our sake at the hands of an unjust government. It looks like a full day dead in a tomb that didn't even belong to him, a borrowed tomb. And it looks like resurrection on the third day, like final victory over sin and death and all the powers that want to enslave us. God's love is nothing if it's not gratuitous and powerful and final and practical. That's the central truth behind all of chapter 4. John has turned his attention back to the people who are troubling his community, who are telling them that they need secret knowledge and passwords uh, to be saved not just from sin but from their own bodies from the material world. He's trying to reassure his people that they have everything they need already. Test the spirits, he tells them. Don't believe everything you hear. Don't believe that everyone who is claiming to speak for God is really speaking for God. And here's the litmus test. Is the person you're listening to claiming that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that Jesus Christ is God, then the Spirit is from God. Is the Spirit denying 
that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, then it's not from God. Right? If you're not state, you think, uh, if you're one of the opponents uh, of his community, you think that flesh is bad, so you deny it. Jesus Christ is not God in the flesh, because God will never take flesh. Well, according to the Lebanese test, right, they deny that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, they deny the flesh part, it's not from God. A few centuries later, the same Lebanese test will be taken uh, for people who say that uh, Jesus Christ is in the flesh, but he's not God. Uh, not, not the Spirit of God, right? You have to have both parts according to uh, this scripture here. Whatever you hear anybody preaching, does it acknowledge and rest on the fact that in Jesus Christ, God is come in the flesh? If it doesn't, don't worry about it. God is love, and God's love is the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ for you. For you. Uh, God's love is active and content specific, but it's also specifically directed. Right? God is not a cosmic Santa Claus. Or, I don't know, some kind of advanced spiritual guru who sits on a mountain and surveys everything from a distance in sort of benign affection. God loves you specifically and since we're being extremely concrete today, that means that God became human and lived and died and was resurrected from the dead, and by doing so, destroys death forever, for your sake specifically. It means that the rule and reign of God is perfect and complete and aimed towards your good specifically. The good news of the gospel is that God is on your side. That God works for the health and flourishing of your soul. And it means he's not going to give up. There was a Eugene Peterson quote going around Facebook. I know some of you saw it because I saw some of you liking it. Uh, and I liked it too. He was, if you don't know, the guy who wrote the message, the most famous thing he did. He was also a pastor. He wrote a bunch of other books as well. Most well known for the message. But anyway, this quote uh, was in the memory of his son, something that Peterson apparently repeated often. God loves you. God is on your side. He's coming after you. He's relentless. If God didn't let the seemingly invincible power of death separate you from him, he's certainly not going to let your mistakes or your stubbornness or your circumstances defeat him. Nothing will separate you from him. That's what God's love means. You're free. You're safe. You are so firmly planted in the love of God that as Paul says, neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor any powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to tear you out of God went to such great lengths for you. Your mistakes aren't going to be the thing that defeats you. Because God loves you with a fierce and active and firm love, you are free to let go of the anxiety that you're still not enough. That you need to seek more knowledge, more works, more public piety in order to prove yourself to God, to prove that you're good enough or sincere enough or holy enough. Perfect love casts out fear. That's what the scripture today said. Your love is not perfect love. God's love is the perfect love. God's love casts out your fear. Martin Luther famously struggled with the anxiety that he wasn't enough for God, that his own problems were going to succeed in eternally separating him from God. And at the end, his answer to this was the advice to sin boldly. Not because sin doesn't matter, not because we love sin, but we don't avoid acting in the world just in case we happen to sin. 
The opposite attitude for this, sin boldly, the opposite attitude uh, is in the mouth of another ancient mystic who said, for fear of the impermissible, we avoid the permissible. Right? That's the kind of anxiety-laden... Uh, we, this, this is really okay, but it's kind of close to something that's not okay, so we're not going to do it. This is not what Luther says. This is not what the Bible says, and it says that perfect love casts out fear. Act in the world, love, strive, live, do your best, and if you sin, if you fall, get back up again. Don't take it too seriously. God isn't going to let that tear you away from him. God knows everything about you, knew everything about you before the creation of the world, and chose to love you anyway. And there's nothing you can do about it. So stop worrying and learn to love as God loves. That's the advice of the scripture today. The perfection, the unstoppableness of God's love means that instead of being bent inwards with anxiety about whether we're good enough or not, we can turn our attention outwards to our brothers and sisters. It lets us straighten out, breathe, and live towards other people instead of spending all of our time worried about our own thoughts and feelings and whether we're good enough. We love, says John, because God first loved us. We can turn outwards in love because God's love has set us free from the anxiety of not being good enough. We learn what it is to love from the way God loves us so that we can love other people, the other people that God also loves. It's never just me and Jesus, right? We've noted in Sunday school, uh, it's our Father who art in heaven. We believe in God the Father Almighty. Our faith and life is communal. The inevitable result of having experienced the freeing love of God is that we turn in love to the people around us. And just like God's love is not vague or theoretical, our love, when it's truly the love which we learn from God, is active and practical and life-changing and costly. It means, John specifically calls out, uh, sharing material possessions. Loving when loving isn't easy. Staying with quarters when it's hard or impractical or uncomfortable. And then he makes us a promise. In this ecosystem of receiving God's love for us, and letting it flow through us into other people, the way we talked about children this morning. God is present himself with us, and the love is made complete, and it doesn't end. We never run out. It's abundant. So, the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish far more abundantly than all we can ask and think him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Please rise if you are able and let us join together in the process.
for coordination and installation.
chosen by God through the voice of, the, of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. We do. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of this church? We do. Would Marie and Adrienne, who have not yet been ordained, kneel as they are able? You are not able to continue to stand. Just come um, right there. Good. And would anybody who is an ordained ruling elder please come to the laying on of hands?
sure and steadfast, and we bless you. We pray for your church, which you have founded, which you have promised that the gates of hell will not overcome it. Grant that this congregation, this local manifestation of your church, may be firmly established and built up in Christ, doing his work and filled with his love. We pray especially today for our newest elders and members of session, and ask that you would fill them with all wisdom and encouragement for the task ahead. We also give you thanks for the elders rotating off session this year, for their sacrifices and faithful service to this congregation. We pray also for other congregations in this region and around the world. Especially, we pray for those who worship under the threat of reality of persecution. This week, especially for the church in Ethiopia and China. And we pray also for those churches whose common life is in danger from complacency. Breathe your Holy Spirit as the breath of life in all churches, so that we all may watch with Christ and witness to your name, so that in, every, that in time every knee may bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, you have called your church as a holy nation, a colony, an outpost of your kingdom in the world. As such, we pray for all nations and people, especially this week for the floods in Venice and the fires that are devastating Australia and California, for continuing unrest in Hong Kong and the Czech Republic, and for all nations and all parts of the world experiencing the devastation of unrest or war or natural disaster. And we bless you for our own nation, and we pray for it. We ask that you would guide us to be a nation of liberty and justice for all, that you would grant wisdom and the love of justice and peace to all who lead us, our president and our governor, and all who make and judge and enforce our laws. We pray also for the other institutions that form us, such as our colleges, our businesses, our universities, that they may discover in you the true life of freedom. And Father, as the lines and divisions that separate us seem to be getting worse with every passing day, we pray that you would heal our civic wounds and grant us the unity of love. God of mercy and compassion, we pray this day for the whole world and also for the individuals that we know and love who need your special care. We remember before you Rementa and her son Wesley and her whole family, and the Loman family as they mourn the loss of Shirley, and all others whom we name before you now in silence. Where there is illness, bring wholeness. Where there is grief, bring comfort. Where there is loneliness, bring companionship. Where there is weariness, bring rest. Where there is anxiety, bring calm. Where there is regret, bring forgiveness. Where there is hunger, bring sustenance. Where there is addiction, bring freedom. Where there is homelessness, bring shelter. Where there is estrangement, bring reconciliation. Where there is conflict, bring peace. Where there is new life, bring joy. Where there is long life, bring satisfaction. And to all of us, bring a good and right and true spirit of thankfulness. Hear us as we pray in the name of Jesus, who came to give his life as a ransom for many, and who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In gratitude and thanksgiving for all God has done for us, let us bring to the Lord the tithes
rise and God brings it back life and labor. Love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with you all.